Hello friends, this is our sixth lecture on feminism, but I would like to start this with an apology and that is in my fourth lecture I made an error and that is I, the vindication by Mary Wollstonecraft was published in 1792. 1792. But in my fourth lecture, I have not deliberately, but it so happened that I wrote 1742. 1742. Publication of Vindic a Vindication of the Rights by Mary Wollstonecraft, written by Mary Wollstonecraft. So this is the fourth lecture I have made a mistake, so cross that out, forgive me for that. And now 1792 is the correct date of publication. Alright, very good, nice. So now we come to the third bill, isn't it? This third bill. First and second we saw. First was actually this focused on uh, voting rights, right to vote, suffrage, this suffrage, so this. that we saw the movement one that both in England and in in the uh, US, in the US. Now the second wave actually just a, a success. There was, you know, there were uh, liberal liberal feminism and radical feminism. And the radical feminists, they were uh, a bit of revolutionaries and so uh, any of whatever, whatever it is, they have achieved many things, so to say. You can say, if you want to count, make, say, make a list of the achievements made by the second wave, you can say, very simple, very clear, access to education, that's a great thing. Women's study, women's studies program, see. First one you can say access to education. That's important. Access to education. So this education. Access to education. Right? So that is uh, very important also now. Access to education. Then second one is you can see connected to that women's studies programs. Women's studies programs, uh, studies programs, women's studies programs, third, access, access, sorry, sorry. <laughs> access to education, then women's studies program, that's another thing, then you have got uh, educational funding, am I that you can say? Educational funding. Educational funding. That's the third one. Fourth one, you can see uh, shelters for the victims of domestic violence. Domestic violence. So you can say shelters for, for the victims of of domestic violence. So you remember now the slogan the personal is political. Uh, sorry, the private is political, personal is political. So there's nothing like domestic violence is not confined with a, within just a family, it's not a private affair. But it is public, is something to do with the, the society, the thinking of the society as a whole. Something public, so creating this public, created, uh, prevent domestic violence and harassment and uh, policies, yes, that's the thing, policies, policies to prevent, policies to prevent domestic violence and uh, shelters for, uh, for those who suffer or suffered from uh, domestic violence and then you have got the public discussion of such uh, offense like uh, here, <coughs> rape, public discussion, that's important. 
public discussion so of rape and uh, and uh, you can also see abuse abuse and this abuse so these are some of the achievements of second wave vegans right yes so policies are there create shelters are there education is there and funding and so you have got a um so then you have again another reproductive rights so okay. access to uh, contraceptives use of contraceptives legalizing abortion so there's another milestone again so reproductive rights reproductive rights reproductive rights and also legal legalizing abortion so these are some of the some of the achievements of second wave i think you are taking this on already so it's not nice as far as we are concerned it's not that important now in the discussion of third wave but you get a background okay okay i hope, hope, hope that you are uh, familiar with these things no yes so liberalism liberal feminists and radical feminists etc So now they come, come, we come to 1991. So third wave is 1990 to 2012. I put a question mark there because some people say it continues. There's nothing like a cut off point like 2012. They say that the third wave is still now. It's going on even now. Understand? So that's why question mark. Some others say they say around 2012. From there we have got the fourth wave. So that's the reason why I have put the question mark that I want to be on the safe side. <laughs> yeah. Okay, 1991 is a very important year as far as as far as our uh, third wave is concerned. 1991. Why? Why? You ask me now. Why? Yes. There was a there was a person. His name was Clarence Thomas. Clarence. This is a boy. This is in USA. Clarence Thomas. Now he was nominated to. He was given nomination to the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court, nominated to as a judge, Supreme Court judge, the U.S. Supreme Court. So he was nominated in 1991. And then a woman, Anita Hill, is her name. Anita Hill. Anita Hill. She accused. him of harassment sexual harassment not any harassment sexual harassment and naturally what will the accused do he denied but as there was extensive debate in the senate in anita hill's accusation and the situation you can understand the person is going to become the supreme court judge and then a woman comes forward and says that this person has I uh, has sexually harassed him. Of course, there was a there was an extensive debate, but what happened is wrong. Voting was in favor of Clarence Thomas, 52-48, 52-48. After a long discussion, debate, discussion, debate. There are forty-eight. That means how many? You can see that <laughs> the difference, isn't it? Now in favor of Thomas. Clarence Thomas, and he did not stop there. This is an anecdote, if you want, you can say like the new historicism. They always give importance to anecdotes. You know? So here you can say something like an anecdote in the beginning of the third wave of feminism. So what happened is that he did not stop there, but what it did end on, you know. And then Rebecca Walker, Rebecca Walker. Uh, Rebecca Walker. You know you are familiar with this name Walker Alice Walker. Alice Walker's daughter, uh, Rebecca Walker, published an article in 1992. Rebecca Walker published in 1992. The date is correct here. No? <laughs> I told you. I made a mistake with vindication, so now I am, I am going to be 
meticul I mean, I will try to be uh, meticulously correct as far as publications are concerned. So, 1992, she wrote an article, you know, and in that article, published article, that she, in that, she wrote like this, see, she said, uh, becoming the third world, that is the article, becoming the third world, becoming, becoming the third wave. Becoming the third wave, 1992, and in which she said, what did she say? I am not a post-feminism feminist, I am the third wave. That's very important. I am not, I am not a post-feminism, like post-structuralism, no? post-feminism feminist, I am the I am the third will. Third will. So this is this is the anecdote. And also it after it's after now. So third will is very important 1991. Then Rebecca Walker, she writes an article and published in 1992. The title is Becoming the Third. Will. And in that she said, I am not a post-feminism feminist. I am the third wave. So here, third wave. Third wave is inaugurated here. See that? So it, it actually, in history, historians of feminism, they say that third wave arose around 1990. Now this much, I think it is clear to you, know. So Anita Hill, Clarence Thomas, then Rebecca Walker, daughter of Alice Walker. Alice Walker introduced that, uh, that term womanist person, womanism, to her contribution to feminist movement. Womanism. Now, I am terrorous by 1990s as a response to the perceived failures of the second wave. But how can we say this? The second wave was a failure. Because we have already listed half a dozen plus one achievements, isn't it? Okay, so this is what the historians say. And the backlash against any, uh, we can say that uh, uh, initiatives and movements uh, created by the second wave. A backlash against uh, the certain in, in initiatives and movements created in the second period. We cannot agree to that fully. So, <laughs> see, these are all things which we can see, you can uh, make your own decisions, but from history we understand that the, the list of achievements already have said no. You cannot say that it was a failure, it was a success, so to say that. Comparatively, it's a success, but this is what the historians say. Already in 1999, there is another uh, feminist, his name is Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. And that is, uh, he said Kimberly. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. C R E N S H A W. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Introduced new feminist currents and theories. Already she had introduced new feminist currents and theories. And you can see some of them I will list here. You are also, you are maybe familiar with that. First one is intersectionality. Intersectionality. Intersection, you know. Cross section, intersection, sagittal section. So, intersectionality. And we will explain it further, but time you understand. Intersection means this. Suppose you are writing like this. And you said this is feminism. Suppose. Intersection means here culture and here race. Here uh, see, intersection, look at this, 
So feminism here and the intersection. So crossing one um, many influences, so to say. Yes. It's not only you can say feminism, the race, culture. Then you have got uh, uh, other theories. See, uh, you have many things are kind of influence no, influence of many things. So just that's what you, the intersection means. Influence. Of, say, I will give you an example. The, a student fails in the exam. Suppose a student fails. The intersectionality would be teaching the uh, the way the student attended the class, the syllabus. The exam type. So, how many things intersect as far as the student's failure is concerned? And his family background, his environment, and uh, the, his ability to uh, study, his brain and uh, lots of things. So, this is called uh, intersection. So, multiplicity of factors, you can say. Multiplicity of factors, not one or two. So, you can say patriarchy is the only. The only cause for the repression of females. But not only for patriarchy, you will find it culture, race. One of them is patriarchy. Patriarchy. The other is uh, your. Uh, uh, what is. Uh, the local influences. A lot of things are there. So, I told you know, this is the failure of a student in the section. So, that is intersectionality. Then sex positivity, new ideas. Second is sex positivity. Sex positivity, these are ideas introduced by Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. Understand, sex positivity. Vegetarian eco feminism, these are self explanatory. No? Vegetarian eco feminism, these are ideas introduced by. Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, the beginning of the third way. Trans feminism, another one, fourth one is trans feminism. Trans feminism. And uh, fifth one is you have got uh, different ideas from trans feminism, postmodern feminism. Postmodern feminism. Postmodern. Feminism. So these are ideas. So now two influences you saw. One is Rebecca Walker, names to remember, Rebecca Walker, and the other one is Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. She had already introduced. And this intersectionality is very, very important as far well as the third way is concerned. Intersectionality. Means the intersex, you know, different things come and intersex, and that is you can say that the woman, uh, and that is especially race and culture, see, that is intersectional. Okay, now we come to, I just mentioned that one postmodernism or almost the same is post-structuralism, that is post-structuralism. Sometimes the historians of literary criticism, they, they use this side by side. That is, Post-structuralism or post-modernism. So that's why I have given here the influence of post-structuralism in the post-structuralism. That is post-modernism. Now, central to third view. Central to third view. This post-structuralist ideas. Central to third view. So you know how, how are we proceeding this now? Because we saw that uh, the, the first we saw an anecdote, Anita Hill and uh, Clarence Thomas, then, then we saw Rebecca Walker, and another uh, feminist we saw introducing new concepts, that is Kimberly William Crenshaw, and uh, now what we see central to the third wave is post structuralism. And what is post-structuralism? What is post-structuralism? Post-structuralism is not a philosophy, it is not a theory, as you know, I need not tell you. But a certain understanding of this term is very important 
if you want to know about their beautifulness. I see I am using that word certain understanding. What do you understand by what do you understand by post-structuralism? This is not a lecture on post-structuralism, but that's why I say a yes, certain understanding. A yes, certain understanding. Or if you want to, if I say the way some people understand post-structuralism. What is post-structuralism? Because that has to be that, that we have to have some idea about that. Then what happens is that you know what that way feminism is. What is it all about? Understand? It's not the, as simple as first wave and second wave. First wave and second wave, we can say linear, not linear progression. But not the way we simply cannot say third wave we say linear progression because you have got gorilla girls, girls wearing uh, then uh, what we call the gorilla masks. See. And then you have got uh, the third wave actually was inaugurated by generation next years. Generation next years. Gen exists. Gen exists. Gen exists. Gen exists. And also the it was influenced by the information revolution and massive dissemination of ideas. Massive. You have got all this. The, your gadget with you know your mobile phone, your WhatsApp, your uh, internet, your uh, Instagram, Facebook, oh what not you know. So actually, is when when we come to third wave, it is a totally different world. So you have gorilla girls, you heard of them? You know? so they put on gorilla and then dance on the street and so on, just to uh, what you call the uh, assert their femininity, see, and also celebrate the. Uh, feminine qualities and characteristics. That is guru love. Generation women and e signs. E signs. E signs. E signs means electronic medicines. E signs. Gen exercise and the health. Most of these people were born the third wave uh, feminist so it's there. The leaders the leadership was taken by people, uh, women who were born uh, say, in, between 1960 and 70. Some of them were daughters of the uh, women, daughters of those women who inaugurated the first wave and who were actually uh, behind the first wave and second wave. So I already I have shown you one. I, we have given we have a name already with this Rebecca Walker, the daughter of Alice Scott. So it's, it's not that easy as we think. But at the same, the point is that in multiplicity, multiple, that's the thing. Post structuralism is also that uh, multiple. Multiplicity attracts you. I hope now you are getting some idea, a taste of what their way of feminism is. Generation excess. This generation next women. And also easy electronic magazine center. Massive uh, information revolution and massive dissemination of ideas. It's not like the first wave of them. You sit somewhere, you have to Take, it will take sometimes days to contact another person. Now it's not like that. By standing here, I can. Why, why should I say something? Because he wants to know. I can call somebody in New York or in London. So the, the information and communication revolution. So, so the third wave, the background of the third wave, we must understand. But then comes in end of post structuralism. So as I told you, a kind of understanding of post structuralism, a certain understanding of post-structuralism is, we can say, post-structuralism, there is absolutely no scope for generalizations. So, first is that, no generalizations. Generalizations. No generalization. Generalization is not accepted in a post-structuralist world at all. Understand that. For example, we can say, uh, then, then in generalization we find philosophy, you know? philosophy of Kant, then you have got Hegel, philosophy of Hegel. So what do you, there, there, what we call in generalization are grand narratives, no space for generalization and grand narratives, grand narratives. So Kant for example, enlightenment philosophy. The Kantian view and the Hegelian view, Enlightenment philosophy. 
what is it history is history is progress and with the rationality using human brain human reason there is bound to be progress for mankind but we already saw first world so the second world war first and second world war we saw uh, we came, almost we went back to square one so that kind of philosophy that is enlightenment philosophy enlightenment philosophy that is there is bound to be a progress for mankind and the history of mankind is nothing but a history of progress that has already simply vanished into thin air so we have to say there is not then the next one is connected with this is grand narratives for example there are certain narratives that that could be applied for everyone that is uh, solution for everyone irrespective of caste creed so for example marxian view the philosophy of marx so is uh, according to marx all the problems that's a grand narrative because it is applicable to everyone every country every situation and what is that grand narrative that if you have got economic reforms then there is bound to be progress in other words exploitation based on uh, the capitalist if you if you get out of the cap if you can get out of the capitalist exploitation then definitely there will be progress and everybody will be living a life of life of comfort and equality so the and problems of the world will be solved as well another grand narrative is that of freud no that is um, psychoanalysis so there's no place for such grand narratives as for as post structuralism is concerned and the third one is so second is grand narrative third is uh, according to post structuralist view there is no single uh, truth no foundational truth is there foundational truth so there is nothing like a single truth but we have only multiplicity of explanations for everything multiplicity search for multiplicity of explanation for man's problems in this world so anti foundationality postmodernism is anti foundational for example see one of the one foundational truth we can say that is a, you, you, you what, what we have in this called a divine providence is a foundational truth once upon a time people thought that everything is controlled by god and god's providence that is if god is in, in his heaven the rounding certain if god is in, in his heaven everything is well with the world so that kind of foundational truth how would you believe in that understand and then you have got fourth one is no universal categories no universal categories no universal categories means there's nothing like absolute say male female you don't have you cannot say male female and that's all then what what will happen outside will go transgender <laughs> and is it so that is a no universal categories understand then nothing like a sisterhood of women or universal group of women so apply to this you can see if you use our know, sisterhood at the end of the second wave so you know sisterhood and universal group etc has no scope as well as postmodernism is concerned so you see what has happened is our what comes is multiple multiplicity see so when you are standing where do you stand your platform is a slippery platform nothing is firm see that is the point understand so this is what you find that in in tsls the wasteland is it you know you are, we we have discussed this many times and then this is a, so there is no founder there is a sender there is a sender the world that is of its have been descended or deconstructed to use the redian phrase deconstructed what is this construction etc when we take when we take a deconstruction you will you will have more of it. now this one example if you the yeah, say if you say like this uh, deconstruction you say about the 
See that uh, that's the famous line. Huh? I shall show you fear in a in a handful of us. You can reconstruct that. See, I the very word I you can see that can be de you can be deconstructed. Deconstruction is not demolishing, not destroying, but trying to find out other layers of meaning. That's the point. That's that is also a certain way of understanding it. <laughs> I don't say that is the absolute way because there is nothing absolute in post-structuralism and and post-modernism in that way. Understand? And then uh, I I told you know I I and you I I'll show you there is no I there is no you in this world why because it is circulating well, you stand there you will call me you if you stand there I will call you you so where is I where is you do you understand that this no such concept as I and you because it can be anybody. So I shall show you fear in a handful of dust if you deconstruct. I say another thing is that layers of meaning you will find in dust. What is dust? Dust can be dust. Another is it has got a metaphorical meaning. Uh, thou art dust and unto dust thou shalt return. That dust. Then then it becomes a metonymy or a metaphor of all your life. Another dust. Means the atomic dust. See that. So what I shall show you fear in a handful of dust. You cannot just interpret it like this. Oh, this is a biblical quotation. No, not at all. One way it is okay. But then you have got the atomic dust also. So then what will happen is that everybody is afraid of everybody. Everybody is afraid of every situation in this world. So total confusion. That is the wasteland. See, just de deconstruction means again enrichment of meaning. Don't put it the other way. If you think that oh, deconstruct means to destroy everything now. That is endless play of signifiers. There's no end to that. Endless play of signifiers, no, absolutely no end. It will again change. See, uh, for example, we, you, you might have come across this example now, that uh, Socrates, no, Socrates, the Derrida himself deconstructs this. He sees the fault, li fault lines or contradictions within it. As Socrates said, the written, a spoken word is better than the written word. This is recorded by Plato. And this is uh, deconstructed by uh, Derrida himself. Spoken word is better than written word. And then what happens is, how do we know uh, uh, Socrates through written word? So there is a contradiction in itself. See, he says that it is better, but at the same time, if written words were not there, how will you understand the philosophy of, or how will you read the philosophy of Socrates? So that is a contradiction. See, to, to find out such contradictions, inherent contradictions or statements, like male, female, that binaries and so on. So that is the concern. So that is what is happening in. So this is what. Uh, such views of the world, such views, such a deconstructive view, if you want, but if you have a Derridian view, you can say, what has happened is ultimately the whole, the, the platform on which we stand has become slippery. So this is applicable to feminism also. This is applicable to patri patriarchy also. So this is applicable to whatever we see around, applicable to texts. So that is, the text the same. The text has every text has what inherent tension. There is a tension as in that just now I told you this my in a my the micro level you can see I will show you fear in a handful of dust. It is a, the the words arranged, the signifiers are arranged in such a way, or the signifiers are presented in such a way that what happens is that uh, there is tremendous tension inside those, inside that simple line. Then what about the whole poem? I do not know. So all these explanations, please don't think this is absolute because we are in a post-structuralist world. So my explanation may not be explanation of another person. So please, you use your brain, <laughs> your reasoning power and see whether there is any sense in what I am saying. In fact, what I have done is about uh, Socrates, 
statement that I have taken directly from Derrida. Derrida. And how Derrida has deconstructed it. Understand? But of course, the land from T.S. Reed is different. So coming back to this, so that is another uh, digression you can say. But it is useful, I think, because you know soon we will be uh, getting in touch with the Derridian concept of deconstruction. And uh, there also, I will say, in a certain understanding, not the whole thing. You know, I don't understand all of <laughs> And then as a result of this one, and then the next is there is no essentialism. Essentialism. There is nothing like essentialism. Essentialism means the qualities that can be applied to all the members of that group. Like for example, male, female, that's what essentialism. No universal categories. You cannot say the in post-structuralist world or post-structuralist view of looking at the world, there is no universal categories. Understand? And uh, along with this, you have got another another very interesting philosophy which you might have come across, existentialism. Existentialism has reversed the Plato's view. According to Plato, what happens the essence first? Essence first and then existence. This is the order in which Plato sees the world. Essence first. For example, when you see man, when you when Plato, that is in, a, in other ways. Duality of existence, duality, duality. The essence of man, that is the ideal man is only in your mind. The actual man and the ideal man, there is difference. The ideal man is perfect, but the actual man is not so. But in this case, what happens? A reversal of this happens when you can take a Prasartra and so on, an existentialist philosophy. They say, existence comes first. And then essence. Apply to this, how will you apply this to uh, male, female, male, female? So, uh, for in, in terms of existentialism, being for, being as, yes, being in itself and being for itself. So that distinction is done. Being in itself itself and being for itself. That is. So being in itself means say so inanimate objects say, chair. Being in itself. It has no movement, no hope, no history, nothing to worry about. But being for itself means it opens up possibilities for you. Being, for example, a woman, she is being for herself. That means she has got a, a innumerable possibilities open before her. So when you, get, when you apply this view, the, this, uh, this view of, uh, in this way if you look at it, uh, male and female, see what happens is, the essence of male and the essence of female is, it depends how you the way you perform. The way you perform. Because you have got the possibility of performing. A chair doesn't have. A board doesn't have. It is being in itself. It has no possibilities. But being for itself, for example, me, I mean, as an individual, I have got, uh, what I should say, thousands of possibilities open before me. Right? My being for myself, being for itself, my being, my sense, etc. So in that case, if you apply this to feminism, life of a woman, being for itself, for herself, that means there is no end to the possibilities open before her. So then there is what we call, then there is no scope for repression. There is no scope for repression because she is as good as. So there is no scope for gender roles. Gender roles are imposed. And when you are you are imposing gender roles on a human on a uh, woman, then what uh, what happens is that her uh, essence, you are uh, she has to hide 
or she is forced to hide. She cannot express her essence because there is power, there is certain ideas are imposed on her gender roles. Women should do like this. That must be so. She should be childbearing. She should be child caring like that. Then where is her essence? She has no scope to express her essence. So you can say that. So these ideas, you know, and this is what I am trying to tell you is that third wave feminism is not uh, as, uh, you cannot go like, a, it's not a single track. You cannot look at it as a progressing in a single track. Uh, track. Multiplicity of ideas, information, dissemination of in information. The way people, uh, we can say, uh, you, you see this is a, a kind of, uh, you, are, you are shaken, so you are shaken. You are shaken by these ideas. You are shaken by electronic magazines. See? There is no scope for you to sit down and say, so these are the things we want you to give a list. No, there is multiplicity of desires, multiplicity of actions, multiplicity of ideas, multiplicity of views, multiplicity of philosophies, multiplicity of their sense. Their sense means how you look at things. Their sense and so on. So you cannot. So what happens is that post-structuralism has opened a floodgate of uh, floodgate of thoughts and also ideas and also the ways to approach things. Understand? So in a way we can say that it is uh, it's, a, it's a world a wonderful world that we are living in today. Because, because if you see the history, you will, you will see always what is happening in the, as Russell says, the strong will bully the weak. This is the history of the world, if you understand, up to post-structuralism. The strong will bully the weak. And uh, in, up to, you, see, you can see colonial powers. You can see man-woman relationship. You can see patriarchy. You can see different uh, discourses of power, male discourses. You can see the um, canon, the canon, the literary canon. See, you can see philosophies. All these are geared to bullying the weak because these have originated from the strong. Whatever has been, whatever has been originated from the strong. It is meant for bullying the weak. That is, this is what uh, uh, Russell sums up by saying, the strong will bully the weak. So I think today this is enough. This is an introduction to third wave. And we will get into that. Where, for example, we will have to keep a William screenshot. Uh, that is the basis of, uh, on which, that is the platform on which we are going to see the third wave, such as intersectionality, sex positivity, vegetarian ecofeminism, trans feminism, and postmodern feminism or post structuralist feminism. So these are the things that we are going to see in the next class. And we'll continue this discussion for some more days, I think. And uh, hope that you are following me. Uh, if I have taken more time, I mean in in trying to oh, explain what the redeem concept of destruction is deconstruction is i think that you will uh, excuse me because to know uh, that the redeem concept post one of the post structuralist uh, positions we can say in post structuralism there are only positions for example focus another position that is power really. power circulates through discourses this is what the to sum up Again, in a certain way, <laughs> I don't want to say this is the absolute, but in a certain way, because as far as we are discussing post structuralism we have to say like that. At least I would like, I, I want to say like, I would like to say like this, that in a certain way, or a certain way of understanding his Foucault's uh, philosophy or his uh, the view of things is power, power circulates through discourses, right from top to bottom. That's, that's, that's one view. So, when you have got the pet, 
patriarchy we always said. So that power supplied through discourses like gender roles and uh, sexism and so on. These are all discourses, right? I hope that you are following me and for, uh, for the time being we will say goodbye, we will continue with this in the next class. If I have made mistakes, I'm sorry, you can point out. Uh, just as a good student, after going through my uh, lecture number four, uh, pointed out that, sir, it is not 1742, it is 1792. And I am very glad and I am very uh, grateful to him for pointing out such mistakes. So you also please do that. In my explanations of post structuralism and so on, you will find any such disagreement uh, with me or with what, what I said. I said, you are most welcome to let me know about that. And further, we will have a, a, we'll have a very constructive intellectual discussion on this uh, in such a way as uh, within, within the limits of my abilities. Okay, so see you again and till, till we see you again. Bye, have a nice time, enjoy it all.